I want to invite you to take out your teaching outlines as we are continuing our message series titled Heart Healthy. And we've been looking at these last couple of weeks, the habits that make for a healthy heart. What is true physically about our bodies in that we have to make sure that we have the necessary habits to take care of the body that God has given to us is also true spiritually. We need to develop uh, the right mindset, the right focus if we're going to be right with God. And so there is a theme verse that we have highlighted, and I pray that you've committed this to memory. I'll say it first, then we'll say it together aloud. It's found right there on the top of your outline. From Proverbs 4.23, it says, Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do. Not some of the things you do. Everything you do flows from it. Let's say it together. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. And that is especially true if you're raising children, no matter how young or old they are. That's especially true on the job and how you treat people. That even goes with how you deal with your enemies, because we're going to have a few of those along the ways. How we deal with our stresses, how we deal with our successes. Life is filled with constant pressure and tension. And how we are doing on the inside, spiritually speaking, how... What is going on with our heart with God will determine the course we go. And so God says in his word very clearly to guard your heart for everything you do. Everything you do flows from your heart. And so therefore, when it comes to being heart healthy with God, we need to do something that's very important. And so write this down. Being heart healthy doesn't depend on my perfection. It depends on my habits. I need to develop the necessary habits, just as is the case with taking care of myself physically, I need to develop the necessary habits so that I could be healthy with God. If I don't do that, there's going to be a drop-off physically in my overall health. You know, my heart is my most important organ as it is for you. Once this thing stops working, well, that's it. If this is unhealthy, it's going to affect every other area of my body. I must be health conscious when it comes to my heart physically, and we must be health conscious when it comes spiritually to our heart. And so each week we've been looking at different habits. We've talked about the habit of honor, the habit of purity, the habit of discernment, the habit of transparency. Last week, a very popular one, we talked about the habit of stress management. This morning I want to talk with you about a necessary habit. And I realize that me even saying this sounds like me telling you to go to the dentist. But it's necessary to go to the dentist, it's necessary to go to the doctor occasionally, and it's also necessary to do this to your overall health, and that is this. We need to develop, write this down, the habit of confession. The habit of confession. Now, some of us might be going, I know what confession is. You know, you you, you wait online, you say the act of contrition, and you make up a few things, and you kind of hide in and sneak in something really big, but you don't really go into full detail because you don't want to get arrested or people think anything bad of you. And that's usually what we think of confession, that i got to tell somebody else my sins, that they have some magical powers, some, you know, red hotline to God, and they'll make it all out, and they'll give me a penance of what I need to do. And some of us say, I will never do that because my penance, I'll be praying until the day I die, I've done so many things wrong. Well, thankfully, there is only one mediator between you and God, and that is Jesus Christ. God has given you direct access to the Lord Jesus. That's not just if you're new in the faith or you have a a couple of centuries of experience in your family in the Christian faith. No matter where you stand in your journey with Christ, God gives you a welcome, open-door policy to bring that which you struggle with. Now, let me just share this with you. That's the last thing the enemy wants you to know. The last thing hell wants you to know is that you could confess your sins to God. Uh, The enemy would rather you stay stuck in guilt. Anybody here ever struggle with guilt? Okay. Is anybody guilty about raising their hand about guilt? Okay. Listen, it's okay. Be honest. We struggle with guilt. You've tried to carry your guilt. How's that working out for you? You don't have big enough shoulders to carry your guilt. There's not enough religious sacraments for you to deal with your guilt. Only God could deal with your guilt. So much so that he's made a blanket promise in the scriptures concerning confession. Notice what it says in 1 John. We'll be looking at 1 John this morning. But in chapter 1, verse 9, the apostle John, who, by the way, and we will draw on this a little bit later on, was an eyewitness to the cross, an eyewitness to the suffering of Jesus. This is what John records concerning confession he says if we confess our sins he being God is faithful notice he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us not from some of the unrighteousness that we do but from all of the unrighteousness 
that we do. That is the promise that God gives to us. If you believe that, say amen. amen. That's our Christian faith. God is standing at the ready to dispense forgiveness for those who are coming with a heartfelt, sincere confession. Confession will now become in your Christian life, without question, after you've received Christ as Savior, the most important action you have as a Christian. Some people think, oh, is it my most important action trying to be perfect and not make any mistakes? No, because you already blew that. Is it my most important action going to church? That is an important action, but confession is even more important than that because if you stop confessing your sins, you'll get so caught up in your struggles, you'll never come back to church anymore. And so in God's infinite wisdom, he has placed confession as without question after you come to Christ, the most important daily activity you can have because it will involve prayer. Sometimes it might involve fasting and it certainly involves the Holy Spirit bringing conviction upon our heart. And so confession then becomes a paramount activity of church. You know, sometimes we think church activities, picnics and, and coffees and fellowships and trips, all of those things are wonderful, but the most important thing on your schedule needs to be a heartfelt confession to God. And that is why the Apostle John, as he writes this epistle now, a much older, experienced man in the faith than he was when he walked with Jesus originally. John, most likely in his 90s at this point. As I've shared with you before, John is an interesting study because they attempted to kill John on several occasions. At one time, they even tried to boil him to death, but that didn't work. He was the only apostle that wasn't martyred. And I think that's significant. Perhaps that was his reward, if you want to call being rewarded by making it through a boiling attempt on your life, rewarding, but maybe that was his reward for being at the foot of the cross and not abandoning Christ like everybody else ran for the hills for fear. There was John at the foot of the cross. And so this morning, I want to share with you then three steps based on this eyewitness, John, of the life and the cross of Jesus. I want to share with you three very important steps toward confession that no matter where you are in your journey with Christ or even if you have not accepted Christ and somebody invited you here today to share in the baptism or to just come and visit this church or whatever it may be, this is extremely important to your life because God never designed or desires for you to carry your sin and especially the guilt that results and the regrets that result from that sin. And so staying in John's book, the great apostle John, I want to invite you to turn to the next chapter, which is 1 John chapter 2. And this morning we will read the first six verses that go right along with verse 9 of chapter 1. The first six verses, the Apostle John is building upon this understanding. Going back now to chapter 1 for the context, John says we write these things that what? Your joy may be complete. We want you lacking nothing. We want the same joy that we have, this fellowship we have with God that is, in, that, that is not interrupted, that is no longer held down by guilt and regret, that we've been made clean in the, the, by the blood of Jesus Christ, ultimately. We want you to have this same fellowship, this same joy. And he goes on to say that if we say that we have no sin, then we're, we're a liar. Who, who, who can stand around and say they have no sin? Now, some people think that. They go, well, I never robbed the bank and I never killed anybody. I guess that's a good thing. But it's not just about robbing a bank or pulling a trigger. There's other things that we can do, that are, whether they are as grievous or less. The fact of the matter is, is that we sin, we have sin, and to say that we don't, we make God out to be a liar. And in essence, we are pushing away the blessing that God gives to us in the area of confession. And so then, we need to understand that God has called you and I to come to him to confess. And so, let's take a look at verse 1 and break this down so we can begin to apply these important principles that John is giving to us. Notice first, John says, my little children, I am writing these things. My little children. Now, where did John get that from? A children's book, perhaps? No. John got that from Jesus. If you remember the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, it was Jesus who called his apostles affectionately little children. John's use of it here is in the same vein. But it adds a little bit even more as we look at this in the original language. What little children means is you born of the faith. You that have been born now in the faith of Jesus Christ. Just like we have a birthday, and just, I'm just throwing it out there so you can put it on your calendar, and I can tell you what I like. I take a large in shirts, 
I can tell you I like the Giants. My birthday is February 2nd, for those of you new to the church. I've been saying we've got to work that into the membership and let people know that when they become a member when my birthday is. Just to, but I'm just kidding. Here's the fact here, is that the Apostle John is affectionately referring to these as his little children, because just as people have a birthday when they are born into this world, they should have a spiritual birthday whenever it is when they come to Christ. And so here John is saying, my little children, those who have been born into the faith of Christ, I am writing these things, that's the scripture, that you, that you, so that you may not sin. I'm writing this to you so that you may not sin. That's the goal. The goal isn't that we're going to be perfect because we know we're not, but the goal is is that over time in our Christian maturity that we would sin less. And as we've said before, we're not ever going to be perfect, we're not ever going to be sinless, but over time as we apply God's Word, we will sin a lot less if we're applying God's Word. And so John is saying we write these things. And so what he's talking about here is the Scripture. Ultimately, the more that we put God's Word in our heart, the less of a desire it will pound back the fleshly desire to do the wrong thing. Listen, you could go to a million seminars, you could spend a million bucks, there's going to be no way possible for you to get your mind and your heart right with God, other than the Scriptures. Because the Holy Spirit will impress upon your heart the Word of God, and the Word of God will then bring conviction of what needs to change in your life. I mean, you can hear a hundred sermons in a row, ultimately at the end of the day, unless the Spirit is reinforcing God's Word upon your heart, it's going to go in one ear out the other ultimately. And so John says, we write these things that you may not sin. And so one of the main ways of how confession then even begins, attaching it to the previous chapter, is it begins with Scripture. And so write this first step down. Step one, fill my heart with the nourishment of Scripture. We have to fill our heart with the nourishment of Scripture. You know, there's so much talk today about being healthy and eating healthy. But we know this much, we've known this for a while, that there are certain foods you should eat and certain foods you shouldn't eat. Now, one of the big issues today with fast food, it might be something you can get very quickly and it might be very cheap, but they put so many chemicals in there to preserve the food that you have to question just how uh, just how much you need this food. The answer is you don't. So I have a picture that I want to throw up on the screen of a bag of McDonald's Happy Meal here that's two years old. Do you see that up there? Two years old, okay? How many chemicals are in there to keep that looking just like you pulled it out of the bag is beyond me, okay? But here's just a hint, and I'm no nutritional expert. I, I don't think you want to put that in your body. But I share with you today, there's a lot of people teaching, there's a lot of books out there that are giving people a lot of fast food Christianity. A lot of things that might be quick and easy, that might sound good, that might even look good, that might even taste good. But there's so much garbage in there that it is not healthy. And in the long run, it will do more harm to your spiritual heart than good. Now, throw up here some of uh, uh, Ray's strawberries and raspberries that he puts in his smoothies here, okay? Now, that looks a little disgusting if you don't have your glasses on, but um, they went bad. That's only after eight days, okay? My wife saw a deal over at Costco for strawberries. You know, they sell like, like about, a, I don't know, 10 feet of strawberries in Costco, right? So, we used them, but, uh, but they went bad after eight days, okay? Same thing with the raspberries. They'll throw it up there as well. Now, that's only after eight days, being in the refrigerator. And that's a common thread with foods that don't have all these chemicals and preservatives in them. That they don't last very long. That's why they're healthy for you, because you're, you, if you're not putting those chemicals in your body through the fast food, well, you're doing yourself a favor. But if you are, you're not doing yourself a favor. See, God wants us to nourish our body with that which is healthy. And not only that, He wants us to nourish our body with that which is healthy. He then wants us to apply the Scriptures. It makes very clear in Psalm 119, thy word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I can share with you on a personal note, this is not just theory, this is on a personal note, that I notice a drop off in my walk with God when I'm not regularly putting God's word into my heart. I could see that maybe I'm more irritable, uh, maybe I'm more given to my old ways, maybe I'm given into temptation more. Why is that? Because I'm not filling my heart with the nourishment of Scripture. And when I fill my heart with the nourishment of Scripture, I also have to act on it. 
I came across a story of a pastor and his friend. Uh, they were friends from, from grammar school. The pastor's friend happened to be a soap manufacturer. And as was their practice, once a year they get together for dinner. And so they would go meet in each other's city. And so they were in the pastor's city that time. They went out to eat and they went for a walk. It was nice out. And the soap manufacturer at this point in his life, uh, not a believer in Jesus Christ, and they're walking along and he says to his friend, he always liked to give him a few zings, he says, you know something, Rev, I got to tell you, I walk around here with you and I think your gospel's not really doing much good. Look how wicked people are living. Uh, look at all the wickedness in the world, not just even in your own city. Well, the reverend grinned because he knew the common zings that his uh, buddy would give him. And so they kept on walking. Then they came upon two kids who were playing in mud. And he says to his friend, he says, now, hey, take a look at these two kids here. He says, look how dirty they are. I guess your soap is not doing much good. And then his friend went, how can you say that? Soap is only useful if you apply it. And the minister looked at his friend and he said, the same thing is true with the gospel. You must apply it so that you could be clean. If you push it away, well, then there's no hope in being clean. The same thing is true to you and I. We have God's Word, just like here in America. We have no excuse. We have so many resources to be nourished in a healthy manner. We have so many resources with God's Word to be nourished. You have opportunity right before you each day. I mean, even think how far we've come with technology. As you sit here this morning, you can have your phone or your mobile device open, and you could follow along on the church's app with the outline that I'm holding up here. You could type in your notes and even side notes that you want, and then you can email it to yourself. We literally have no excuse today in the age of technology that we live in not to nourish ourselves with the Word of God. And so therefore, I submit to you today, if you're going to be healthy and have the habit of confession, you will never even want to confess anything if you're not having the proper nourishment. Because I don't know about you, but I think I'm always right. Anybody else with me? I think I'm always right. The rest of you are liars. You've just broken one of the commandments. Thou shalt not lie, by the way. We think we're right all the time. Well, it's not that bad, God, and nobody got hurt, and, and that's how we are. We think we're right. We think, oh, it's never too bad, but we don't understand. We've offended a holy God, and he loves us, and he wants us to work it out with him. He wants us to make it right with him. He makes very clear, come and reason with me. I have the ability to make you as white as snow. That's what God could do. He could take that which is scarlet, stained in our life, and he could make it white as snow. We must commit then to filling our heart with the nourishment of scriptures because that step will lead to then having this desire to confess. Now write this second step down. We want to fill our heart with the nourishment of Scripture, but on an everyday basis, flush, write this down, flush my heart out by having a daily cleanse. I want to have a daily cleanse in my life. I want to flush my system. Now, flushing your system of all the toxins in your body obviously is a very healthy thing to do. But you must make sure you consult a person who is a knowledgeable and professional nutritionist because there's a lot of, again, a lot of, just like there are those unhealthy fast foods, there's some unhealthy diets that are out there today that are actually, they, they're putting more chemicals into your body. So we must consult uh, the proper nutritionist if we're going to do that. The same thing is true with this. We got we to gotta consult the Lord when it comes to flushing our body. Now, how do we normally flush our body here in the Northeast in this corridor of the United States that we live in? Well, I got to do. I got to do more. Okay, I had a bad Friday night. I hope, hopefully nobody saw me what I was doing, okay? Not me. I'm just putting it out there. I'm just saying as an example, okay? But I, I got to give a little more this week because, man, you don't know what I was doing Friday night. Or I've had a bad month with God. I've been saying this, and I've been treating my husband this way, or my wife that way, or my children this way, or my parents that way. So let me, what can I do? Can I clean the toilets in the church? Can I sweep the floors? By the way, you could do that any day of the week, by the way. You don't need to have a bad week to do it. And I'm certainly not going to use that guilt over your head, although it has crossed my mind in the past to do that with people, but I won't do that. Here's the thing. God doesn't need you to compensate for your stupidity, nor does he need me to do that. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was once and for all. 
And so the ultimate way to flush your heart out before God is to trust that. Now returning to 1 John chapter 2 says this, and if anyone sins, oh if anyone sins, that's really rhetorical by the way. In other words, John is throwing it out there, not saying is there any sinners out there? Of course there is. If anyone sins, notice this now, we have an advocate with the Father. Now, amen. That, now that term is familiar in our culture, an advocate is gives the understanding of someone who comes alongside. It is similar to the word paraclete, like the word paraclete for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes alongside. The advocate gives us this understanding of a divine attorney. The same way that an attorney would come alongside their client to represent their client in a court of law for whatever accusations have been made against them, Jesus is our divine attorney. He stands before God, the judge, and he presents the case. But the case isn't very long. Now, you watch some of these TV shows, the case can be a to-be-continued. You know, you watch some of these shows on TV or even some real-life court shows. It could take weeks and months. The court case with God doesn't take very long. Jesus, not that God has forgotten, says to God the Father, I have cleansed them in the blood on the cross when I died for their sins. And the case, the gavel comes down dismissed. He is our advocate, our divine advocate. But keep in mind, the accuser of the brother and the devil, the enemy, he wants to keep bringing accusation against you, even to yourself. You might have this ongoing battle within your own heart and your own mind of how lousy you are of how terrible you are, how big your past is. But every time the enemy wants to remind you of how big your past is, obviously in faith, remember how great and big and awesome your God is and how sufficient his sacrifice is. Because it goes on to say we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. In other words, Jesus Christ who is perfect. That's what that is bringing mention of here. And he himself is the propitiation, it says, of our sins. Now, propitiation is a theological word, a doctrinal word, but let me just bear it down to the bare bones here. It means very clearly, this word, that God's wrath has been satisfied. That's what it means, that the wrath of sin has been satisfied. And look no further than the cross. When Jesus was on the cross, if you remember, darkness came over the earth. That wasn't just a forecast of darkness. That was without question God visiting Golgotha, visiting the cross. And in those three hours that darkness fell over the earth, God was judging the sins of mankind. The darkness of Good Friday is the darkness that John is bringing here. And again, who better than John to write about that because he witnessed the darkness. He was literally there. He heard the words of Christ. He heard Jesus say, Jesus committed his mother into his care. He heard Jesus forgive the thieves. He heard Jesus forgive the people who were gambling and casting bets over his garments. He heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The people who with their very hands punched him in the face and plucked the hair out of his beard. The very people that crucified him naked in all humiliation on a cross. John witnessed all of that. And John witnessed the words and heard the words. That's why he wrote them down. The words that literally made Hell shake when John recorded the words of Jesus when Jesus said after the darkness was over, it is finished. That was the death blow to sin and death once and for all. When it comes to confession, you could go directly to Christ because he literally paid the bill. And John recorded it. The wrath of God, as I've shared with you before, is not that you get a surprise tax bill in the mail. Although, please, God, give us mercy with these New York taxes. Amen. Anybody out there today? Okay. Right? Taxes, tickets, tolls. I mean, oh, my. It's crazy. It's not just getting a flat tire. It's not, you know, getting an offender bender on the way to church. You know, I got a call earlier. Jen was on her way to church, and she got hit right in the back. And so the guy says, you know, we could settle this right here. I'll give you $100. And I said, I said, honey, absolutely not. It costs thirty dollars to get an oil change, a hundred dollars. It costs a hundred dollars to pick up a magazine when you go to an auto body shop for crying out loud. And so obviously the police are on their way to take care of that and look into that. But that doesn't mean that God's wrath is upon us. Just be, see, some of us think that way. I had a bad day today, or my hair didn't set right, or um, I got a stain on my favorite shirt, so God's after me. No, no, God's wrath was satisfied on the cross. We must realize that. 
God's wrath is not just bad luck, as some people like to think. That's not it at all. God's wrath is separation from him. But Jesus experienced that, so we would never have to experience it. Just do a study on it. Jesus always referred to God as Father. But on the cross, in that darkness, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because for the first time ever, and never to happen again, God the Father and God the Son was separated. But then after it was all over, it was Father again. The darkest hour in history was what John is talking about right here. And because that darkest hour of history was experienced by Jesus, that means without a shadow of a doubt, you have an open door policy to go to God just as you are, to come to him, to flush it out. Now, I shared this a while back once before, but it fits so well here. A pastor one day after service was helping a congregant, and that congregant was at the altar praying. And this is what his prayer said, Lord, take the cobwebs out of my life of all my sin. And just as the pastor heard him pray this, he interrupted and he said, Lord, kill the spider in this man's life. You know, some of us, oh, Lord, uh, just, Lord, pr- take, the, take the feeling away of what I'm going through. God says, I'm not just interested in taking the feeling away. I want to remove what's causing that feeling. I want there to be legitimate change. By the way, that's what repentance is. Repentance is God. Confession is God. I agree with you, and now I want to walk the way that you've called me to walk. I no longer want to live a life of disobedience to you. Now, I know what some of you might be saying, obedience, oh, don't bring that word out. I don't like that. But my friends, obedience is necessary in your life, and your walk with God, in any relationship if it's going to be healthy, by the way. In fact, God loves you so much that he's given you this opportunity to obey him because he loves you. Now, oftentimes, obedience doesn't make sense. But you will remember this, God will bless you and honor you as you honor him. He takes full responsibility for a life that is given over to him. And so, flush out. Flush out what doesn't need to be there. And I recommend a daily cleanse. Have a a filling of the Scripture in your life always. And then flush out each day. In fact, somebody once said, keep short accounts with God. That is what God wants to do in your life. Now, you might think, man, I'm I'm just going to hold on to it for a little bit longer. Well, you never know how God's going to get it out of you. There was a boy who he was, uh, for lack of better terms, physically challenged in terms of his height. He was very short. He was even shorter than the water boy on the basketball team. But his father was a basketball player. He wanted his son to play ball. So we went to the coach, uh, and he said, Coach, how can I get my son on the team, even though he's very short, and he'll never, he doesn't reach the hoop. And his, uh, the coach said, you know what? Your son's young enough. Why don't you go down to the museum and ask him if you could use the torture rack and stretch him out there? So... Father said, okay, I'll listen to the coach. The coach was real famous, small town, knows a lot, okay. So he took him there. And so he put his son on the torture rack, and uh, he stretched him out, and the son, you know, was there. And then obviously after it was over, the coach asked him, well, how'd it work out? You've been doing it now for a little while. And he says, well, my son didn't get any taller, but he sure did confess to a lot of things he was doing around the house. That's how we are with God. We wait and wait and wait, and then sooner or later, God is going to put us in a situation when it's going to come out of us. Don't wait to go on uh, what might be your torture rack. I don't know what it's going to be. God loves you. He cares for you. But one way or the other, he's going to bring conviction in you. And he's not going to literally put you on a torture rack. But your guilt will torture you. Your guilt will bring all types of anxiety upon your life without you even realizing it. Looking in your notes, there are some benefits to confession. Notice this. Confession produces peace. Confession will produce peace in your life. Because one of the things that will torture you will be your own anxiousness over your sin. Psalm 38, 18 says this, For I confess my iniquity. Iniquity means to be bent in the Hebrew language. I confess the fact that I am bent, O God, that my will and my desire is bent. For I confess my iniquity. I am full of anxiety because of my sin. See, we have anxiety over bills, over people. I understand that. Over work, perhaps, over getting on a plane, or whatever it may be. But I'm going to tell you something else that brings anxiety in our life. Sin. When we don't deal with our sin, we are actually incurring a lot of anxiety, unnecessary, I might add, anxiety upon our life. But confession will produce peace. Flipping over your notes, notice this. Confession produces prosperity. 
God's will is for you to prosper spiritually. God's will is for you to prosper on the inside, without question. Now, if we prosper outwardly with possessions, who knows? That's up to God. We're not going to get caught up in that. A lot of people focus on outward prosperity. The Scriptures and the Holy Spirit points us to inward prosperity. And so confession produces prosperity. It says this in Proverbs 28, verse 13. Now, notice this. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them, notice, will obtain mercy. You will flourish with mercy. I don't know about you, but I need mercy in my life. I need God's mercy. You know what? We need mercy so much, that's why it renews each day. God's mercies renew each day. Just as you woke up today, God said, you know what? They're foolish. They need new mercy. Here it comes. God is always one step ahead of you and I, and he gives us new new mercies each day. And then thirdly, notice, confession produces a pathway to health. It produces a pathway to hell. Now, first let me say this. By having a daily confession doesn't mean you'll never get physically sick. I'm not saying that. Some people erroneously teach that way. Some people think, well, you're sick because you got some sin in your life. Didn't Jesus teach about that in John chapter 9 when they were condemning the man who, was, who had blindness? And they said, well, who sinned, him or his parents, okay? And Jesus said, neither. This has been allowed that the glory of God may be revealed. And so when there's sickness in somebody's life, it's very legalistic as well as unbiblical for people to always put out the finger and cast judgment upon people. So let's not go down that route. But let's also understand that if we conceal our sin, as we've seen in the previous two scriptures, it will lead to stress and anxiety, and stress and anxiety can without question make you physically sick. Are you with me so far? Okay, so here, look at Psalm 32, 3 and 5. When I refuse to confess my sin... My body wasted away. Wow. I could relate to this as a sinner. Can anybody else relate to this? When you conceal sin, amen. And I groaned all day long. In other words, I started complaining. And for you and I, we don't know what David's complaints are. Maybe, our, maybe we're complaining against God. God, when are you going to show up? And God's going, when are you going to show up? Maybe we're blaming other people. Maybe we're blaming our circumstances. We're playing the blame game. Isn't after all that what Adam and Eve did with the first sin? Groaning all day long, day and night, oh God, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. Because like any loving parent, we're told in Hebrews, God will discipline us. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. How about that? Verse 5, finally, finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. You ever try to hide guilt? It's like trying to hide an elephant, okay? It's impossible. You can't hide your guilt. No matter how clever you think you are, eventually, eventually, your guilt is going to sneak back up on you. You need to give it over to God, and you need to confess your sin. David says, I confess then my rebellion to the Lord. I confess my rebellion. And notice this, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Listen, some of you, you may have tried to take, take your guilt to a fortune teller. All that did was what? Cost you $25. It made you feel weird if somebody tickled your hand, by the way, okay? Maybe some of us, oh, you know, you saw somebody on TV, oh, give, give me $100, I'm going to send you some prayer oil, put that on your life, and you're going to start living right. All you did was waste $100. Let me do this sacrament, let me do that, let me get, it doesn't work that way. Let me go directly to Christ. Let me confess even my guilt over to him. He promises to forgive me. And by the way, he's perfectly able to because he satisfied the wrath of God totally. And I want to flush it out with him. And so then write this final step down. We said we have to fill our hearts with the nourishment of Scripture. We have to flush out, flush out that which doesn't need to be there daily with a daily cleanse. And then step three, this final step, very important if we're going to keep on having this heart of confession, this habit of confession, follow God's commands with a heartfelt effort. Follow the commands of God with a heartfelt effort. You know, when you watch, for example, athletes compete, they're not just showing up to the game. They've put in hours of preparation. They've looked at the game tape. They have studied their opponent. They have conditioned their body in such a way that enables them to compete for some at the highest level of sports. Now, some of us, we watch that and we go, wow, look at, look at how they're doing this and look at how they're doing that. 
Well, there had to be a level of sacrifice that was put in there. There had to be a regiment that was followed. For you and I as believers, we want to follow the commands of God. John encourages and counsels here in 1 John 2, 3 to 6. He says, by this, we know that we have come to know him, that being Christ, if we keep notice his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commands is a liar. So this is connected to the previous chapter. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. We learn later on that perfect love casts out all fear. Well, we're never going to understand the perfect love of God if we're going around not willing to keep his commands, not willing to have this heartfelt effort that God has. He says, by this we know that we are in him. Now, this is a familiar phrase from his gospel when he talks about abiding. It's not just knowing God or referring to God. Abiding means that I understand that the Holy Spirit has taken residence in my body, that the Holy Spirit has fell upon me, that the Spirit is leading and guiding me. This is not just casual here. This is commitment, a heartfelt commitment to the commands of God. By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says He abides in Him ought Himself to walk in the same manner as Christ has walked. This speaks of an outright commitment. An all-out commitment to Almighty God. Now, looking in your notes before we close, there are some commands to follow. There's first the commandment of repentance. To ask Christ into your heart. The great commandment of all, to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, is attached to the understanding that you have to ask Christ into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. If you've never done that before, no better day than to do that today. For you to say, Jesus, I confess my sins to you. I know I'm a sinner, and I ask you into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. God has put that before you and I. Another command that God gives to you and I, although it's not necessary for salvation, it is evidence that you have placed your faith in Christ, and that is baptism. And so if you've placed your faith in Christ, the next step in your journey is baptism. Now, wouldn't it be great? If we had a baptismal set up, oh, look behind me. Here's one right here, okay? You may wonder what that is. If you're new to the church, you're going, what in the world? They have a jacuzzi after service. Everybody jumps in. This is a portable baptistry. And this building was tailor-made for us long before we ever knew we were going to be here. There's, this, there's concrete barriers underneath the second stage. There's a hose off to my left over here in the back room here just so we could fill up the baptismal. God knew exactly what we needed for this church before we moved in here. And so today we have a baptism after both services, and uh, the, at the early service, late service. And so if you've placed your faith in Christ, the water's beautiful and warm. God has put this before you. This is your next step. And after service, some of the prayer ministers would be happy to talk through that with you even more. Now, I know some of the common excuses. I forgot my clothes. Don't worry. You can use one of Pastor Ray's clean shorts and towels and shirts. Don't worry. We've covered all bases today. So if you've put your faith in Christ, and maybe today you're going to put your faith in Christ, get baptized, don't put it off any longer. We wholeheartedly encourage you to do that. That's a command God has put before you because that step of obedience will help you to take more steps of obedience. And I personally invite you as your pastor to take that step today. Don't wait. And even if you've got to go home, you want to come to the 6 o'clock service and do it. That's fine. The water's here. Come get baptized today. A tremendous step for you to take in your life. But there are more commands that God gives to you. Jesus says, confess your sins to others. James chapter 5, verse 16 tells us, confess your sins to one another. Now, it doesn't mean people have the ability to give you forgiveness that God can only give, but sometimes you've got to share your struggles with other people. Who better to get through an addiction with you than somebody who's been through an addiction? Who better to help a single parent who's trying to manage bills and take care of the kids, no matter how young or old they are, than somebody who's been there, who may have made their own mess-ups in life? We need each other. God has not given you uh, any commandments to do this Christian walk in isolation. That's usually what the enemy wants us to do. He wants to isolate us from the people of God. One of the ways to have the habit of confession is to insulate yourself with the things of God, to be committed to God that way. And then how about John 8, <coughs> chapter, chapter 8, verse 11? Jesus with the woman who was caught in adultery. Remember, everybody was getting ready. They were loosening up their arms like pitchers in a bullpen, getting ready to strike the woman with the rock. And Jesus came over there, and he said, he's without sin, cast the first stone. And the rocks dropped one by one after he did a little writing on the ground. Now, he then said to the woman, do whatever you want. No, he didn't say that. He said what? Go and sin 
no more. That's a command. As God cleans you and as you flush it out with Him, don't trample on His grace. Don't treat His grace like a trapeze net as you go from, you know, stupidity to stupidity and sin perch to sin perch. He's died for your sins. He rose from the dead. He cleans you up and He says, you know what? Go and sin no more. I got a new course for you to walk. And then here's another commandment to throw at you. After you've learned from your own mess-ups and your own sin, God wants you to go help others. David taught us that in Psalm 51, 13. We're to go teach others from our sins. David said that he was going to let what God showed him be on his lips to show other people. That is what God has called you and I to do. That is his will for you and I. We must receive that today. We must be committed to that. I have on stage with me today three hangers that I wanted to show you. This first hanger literally broke this morning as I was carrying my clothes over, okay? And this hanger, we bought these hangers and we thought it was a good deal. It was $4.99 for 30 of them, okay? But all 30 of them have broken, and here's the hook that goes with it, okay? And no matter what you put on here, after a few uses, it just collapses. This is what I equate what we usually trust in to hold up our confession. You know, religion or man-made ways or money or things of that nature, it's going to break eventually. It's not going to hold you up. That's the last thing you want to do. But then there are some things that look like they can hold you up, but they don't. And no offense to anybody who owns a dry cleaners that comes to the church or watches at home, but here's the old dry cleaning hanger, you know, right? You've seen these before, right? These are good, but they bend if you put anything heavy on it. And I mean, it becomes more or less a good plunger for your sink. If you don't want to call the plumber, that's about it, okay? But I'll tell you what really works. These plastic hangers, these are real strong. I put a lot of things on here. I submit to you this morning to take the question to heart. What am I hanging? What am I hanging my confidence on when it comes to my sins? Am I trusting in God or am I trusting in something that is literally breaking apart every time I do that? I need to go to God, not in fear. I could approach His throne of grace boldly, knowing that He stands at the ready to offer forgiveness. This is illustrated for me by a story of an attorney. He had 17 clients who owed him a lot of money from past services. He wound up finding Christ, and God impressed upon his heart. He had done so well in life, to pass it on to those clients, some of which were in debt. And so he wrote 17 letters to all of those clients about how their debt was canceled and why it was canceled in Christ. And he even put some scripture in there. He certified the letters so that it would require a signature. 16 of the 17 letters were returned. Later on, he found out out of fear because he had to track these people down. They thought he was going to sue them. But all he wanted to do was forgive them of their debt. My friends, sometimes I know I'm like that with God. He's coming to me. He's convicted me through a scripture, through a song, coming to church, through somebody else's story, the Holy Spirit, whatever it may be. God is reaching out to me, and he's not looking to condemn me. He's not looking to break me down. He wants to remind me that the debt has been paid in full, and that I can come to him. I can have this habit of confession, not for religious purposes, but because I am his son, you are his son, you are his daughter, and he welcomes you to come to him just as you are. To spend any more time meandering in the maze of mediocrity or being given to the rules of religion is forgetting who your heavenly Father is, that He loves you unconditionally, that His Son went to the cross on my behalf and your behalf. He didn't just take Barabbas' place. He took my place and He took your place. And as He hung there on the cross, He died there for our sins. But not only that, He died also for the guilt and the regret and the resentment and everything else. And it doesn't stop there. The same power that Christ went to the cross with is the same power that is alive and well in the hearts of believers today. This habit of confession is so important because if you can live a life that is no longer held down to the chains of your past, you could press forward in the plans that God has for you. 
this is the will of God. This is his heart for you and I. He desires that we would walk by faith, not by sight. He desires that we would trust in his everlasting arms. He desires that we would be committed not to our own devious ways of making up what we need, but trusting in his eternal riches, trusting in his provisions, and most importantly, trusting in his mercies. My friends, God is calling you and I today to profess and confess, to flush it out, to fill up our hearts with his word, and to follow him wholeheartedly, just like John did. Even if it meant we gave up this or we gave up that, let the focus of our heart forever be, I believe as John wrote this, he was thinking of the cross. When you go to confess your sins, don't think about how rotten you are and how big of a problem it is. Close your eyes and picture the cross. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that you've shown to us. Lord, it's somewhat convicting for us to hear a message on confession. But we know it's necessary. Search our hearts, O God, as David prayed. Try us and know us. See if there's any wicked way in us, O God. Make our path straight, O God. May the very meditation and motive of our heart reflect you, O God. We thank you for the cross and the empty tomb. And we thank you, O God, for your mercies that renew each day. Lord, I pray for any brothers and sisters that are here today or watching at home where they have been held captive by their past and their sin. Lord, remind them of your grace. Remind them of the peace that you want to give. Well, we thank you, O God, We thank you for enduring the cross and the wrath. And we ask, O Lord, that you would forever be our focus. We commit this morning to fix our eyes upon your son, Jesus Christ. We commit these prayers. And we also commit those today coming to be baptized. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.